Okay. So, hi, everybody. I, I see everybody is coming in quickly into the attendee room, and I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Maria Evans. I'm the Artistic Director for the Arts Council of Princeton. And if you're joining us uh, for the first time, welcome. If you're returning, you sort of know the format. Um, but this is In Conversation, and tonight we have our host, our, our loyal Ever ready host Tim Andrews, who was a former board president for the Arts Council of Princeton, and he's on the executive committee now for the McCarter Theater, among being a um, business owner and also a uh, an outstanding supporter of the arts. He has an amazing collection on his own, and he is a, a wonderful host for us. And tonight we are interviewing Adam Welch who is uh, now my boss. So I didn't wanna be late for this, um, but uh, I'm not gonna spend too much time introducing Adam because uh, that, that's what Tim will do tonight. But uh, I did have the pleasure of meeting Adam years ago when he was in an exhibition at the Arts Council. And he makes these um, crazy bricks that he puts on the floor, which he'll tell you about, but thank God I was nice to him because now, uh, <laughs> now he, the, the roles have, have uh, reversed or, or um, yeah. So you never know who's gonna be your boss someday. So let, let that be the moral. Um, but I wanna turn it over to Tim and Adam because we have a lot to get to. Um, Adam has a very rich existence and, um, we may as well get right into it. So welcome everybody. I think you are in for a very good show tonight. And Tim, I'll turn it over for you. Great, thank you, Maria. I wouldn't say that it, the roles are reversed. I would say that the uh, that the stars aligned. How's that? I think that's a better. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the stars yeah. aligned. <laughs> thank you so much, Maria. Maria. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to unplug. I I can't look at myself on the screen like this. Do you still see her? I still see her, yeah. Well, let's get started. We'll, we'll, hope that, we'll, we'll hope that we figure out how to get that to go away because you're right, that's a little disconcerting. I'm looking at twins right now. So, um, so Adam, uh, welcome to the In Conversation uh, uh, this evening. Uh, it's really a pleasure to spend some time with you tonight. Uh, I would just remind um, our viewers that we've got a nice chat window on the right-hand side probably. And if you want, um, if you have any questions during the, um, during the evening, uh, you know, type them in there and we'll try to take questions either in real time if they're timely or at the end if we have time to, to get to the questions we hope to do that. So Adam, um, welcome to the Arts Council. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you tonight and it's a pleasure to have met you a few weeks ago uh, in person finally in a socially distance appropriate setting in somebody's backyard. Um, but let's, let's start, you know, so tell us about where you were born and sort of what were those early years like uh, of Adam? Okay, sounds good. So uh, first, uh, thank you, Maria, for the introduction, and uh, and thank you, Tim, for for having me on tonight. I'm super thrilled. Uh, where did it all begin? Well, Burke, Virginia, of all places, uh, and uh, my lovely parents, uh, Barbara and Anthony, uh, amazing, amazing supporter of of my youth and artistic endeavors. Uh, I could never have thought I would have such amazingly supportive parents, but I think that might have to do with, I was the last of four children. Uh, and so at that point there, I think they were a little bit more worn down uh, than anything else. But, uh, you know, my my family from the very beginning, all of them, my, uh, my brother Fred and my sisters, uh, Andy and Tony, have just been really, really supportive of all my endeavors, which has been really, uh, really great. Um, so I think, um, you know, it all started in high school. I think, um, you know, really, I was uh, like every other uh, kid, didn't want to be there, uh, wanted nothing to do with uh, school, and I spent most of the time skipping classes and uh, doing everything I could to avoid school, and uh, I was at a very large um, public school in Virginia, had, I don't know, 6,000 students, and they had... Uh, they had said, what, what would it take to keep you uh, from skipping classes? And I said, uh, ceramics. I want to take ceramics. So they allowed me to take ceramics three of the six periods out of the day. So I was in ceramics class half the day, my junior and senior year. And uh, I, uh, you know, I had, an art, I had an art show and a sale and uh, sold, 
sold my work, made enough money to buy a potter's wheel. And I said, you can make a living being a potter. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's the trajectory there. So, so we got to back up here because there's, there's some, a couple of things missing, I think. First of all, um, you know, you know, Play-Doh, you know, as a kid, I mean, you, you must have been doing things in elementary school and, and sort of, so, because how did you know ceramics, right? So, so tell us a little bit about the little earlier time and sort of what that was like, because there, there must have been some, some, some exposure uh, before we got into high school, for sure. You're right, you're right. You're right. I don't think it was Play-Doh, but it was close. I, um, I did, uh, you know, I, like I had mentioned, you know, my parents were uh, really supportive and they were really active. And one thing that they really allowed me to do was just explore materials. And, you know, my dad was a very hands-on uh, father and hands-on man. And, um, you know, woodworking was a big thing. Um, were they artists? Were either of them artists? Uh, n no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> my, dad, my dad can draw, my dad can draw. And, uh, but no. Uh, none of my uh, other siblings went in that, that direction, but um, I started with like um, carpentry. Uh, mm -hmm. and I was building little uh, tchotchkes. I, I used to make, um, you know, flower holders for decks and I, I made these Santa Claus things. And, and I think, you know, I don't know, it's not dating myself, but, you know, really in, uh, in seventh grade, so pretty early on, you know, we took shop class, so it was called mm -hmm. shop, I don't know what you call it now. And we were able to do a lot of woodworking in there. So that was something that encouraged it even more. And uh, in seventh grade, I had a, a teacher uh, and I remember her, Mrs. Poppin was her name. And uh, she uh, had a, a, a ceramic lesson. And so I made a lighthouse. Uh, the reason I made a lighthouse is because I was inspired by Bob Ross, uh, who everybody knows is one of the greatest uh, American painters of all time. Uh, and so, uh, so I made this lighthouse and that was my first experience with clay, but really, I guess, um, you know, besides having little tiny adventures in, in materials, um, you know, uh, pr projects with painting and whatnot, um, I saw, I saw a wheel demonstration. I saw a ceramic demonstration by a, a, a gentleman by, by the name of, um, a George Giuliano, who would later be my teacher, uh, from, uh, 10th through, uh, 12th grade in ceramics. And, in my school, you couldn't start, I think it was until 10th grade, uh, just for sort of focus and dexterity reasons, I guess, uh, safety reasons too. Uh, he did a wheel demonstration, I, uh, either in seventh or eighth grade, and I watched that, and it really moved me. It was, um, it was an amazing experience to see the transformation of the lump of clay, um, you know, into, into a, a, a form that appeared to be finished. You know, I realize now that there was a lot more steps uh, that sort of followed that, but you know, ultimately seeing that demonstration, which is one of the reasons I like to demonstrate so much now, especially to, um, you know, adults like to watch it too, but I love to uh, demonstrate the wheel to, to, to children and, and at the high school level, just because there is this, this real moment of, of awe, I think, uh, which is really, uh, I think really important for, for anyone, but certainly for kids, you know, to, to be able to see it. And, um, and so seeing that transformation at a young age, I said, well, I really want to, I want to explore that when I'm, when I can. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like I said, going back to, you know, I can't thank, you know, I can't thank my family and, uh, parents enough for just allowing me to explore. And, you know, my parents bought me a, a bandsaw or whatever. And I mean, I, I don't know if I'd ever buy my kids a bandsaw, but they bought me a bandsaw <laughs> and I just started cutting wood and, and building junk. And it was just, um, you know, it really set me up to, uh, to being, um, you know, really uh, prepared for that, for that experience on the wheel. So it sounds like in high school you were doing not only ceramics but also using other materials. So it wasn't it, you weren't limited to, to that. Did you ever do any painting and, and other kinds of art or explore that in, in high school? And then we'll get to later. But in high school, or was it really ceramics and and some woodworking? No, in high, in high school we did. Um, you know, I did do some painting. I did. We had drawing, painting, photography. Um, you know, I, I you know in shop class I did a little welding. I mean, I nothing. You know no real sculpture or anything, but we did welding. I mean, we were doing all kinds of, um, you know, material exploration and, uh, you know, from making pinhole cameras, which was really exciting to, um, you know, like painting, uh, you know, painting big canvases and, you know, construction paper, cut out collages. I mean, it was really, you know, I gotta say for as much as I hated school, the experience that I got from, uh, from that, that school and the amount of support. I mean, it, it's a it's a great school, or it was a good school district. I mean, it's huge. Um, 
there's a thousand people, or there was when I was there, a uh, hundred thousand, no, a million people in Fairfax County when I was there. Um, but, you know, really they had, you know, sort of unlimited supplies and just so much support. And they had great teachers. Uh, you know, I remember Mr. Hammonds, uh, you know, I, I remember their names, you know, and like I said, mm -hmm. George Giuliano was there. And, um, you know, I think, I think largely it was, you know, once I got my hands wet with the clay, uh, you know, I, I knew that was something that I'd always uh, return to something sort of like always my first uh, sort of touch is, is with clay, although I've worked on, and we'll get into that, some of that here, but I've worked on many other materials since, but, um, you know, I can really pinpoint it to, um, you know, just really supportive uh, early um, exposure to art and, uh, you know, really, really made a difference. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I can't, you know, stress enough now, you know, the importance of art education, you mm -hmm. know. And so after high school, so what happened after high school, you got the wheel, and what happened? You decided you're going to try to make a life uh, and, a, and a living with with a wheel. Yeah. So you know, it's I can you know I can date a lot of this stuff, which is a little scary, but hopefully I can remember it later on. Um, March uh, 1995, uh, there was a ceramics journal called Ceramics Monthly, and on the cover of it, and actually that magazine's just back there on the bookshelf. Uh, on the cover of that was a potter named Sven Bear. Sven Bear is a uh, potter out of England. And on the cover, it's this, you know, it's this, you know, this guy with this sort of wild hair and a big kiln behind him and big, huge pots. And I read the article and it was about this country potter. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, you know, I really, you know, I'd love to be a country potter. Um, but before we get to college, uh, you know, as I had mentioned um, in high school, the last thing I wanted to do was more school and I didn't want to go to college. And uh, one of the rules my family had was you have to go to college and you have to go to a state school. Uh, but I, you know, as stubborn as I am, I refused to go to college. And my senior year of high school, a uh, buddy of mine at the time, Pat Ryan and I jumped in my, uh, my parents' 1976 Volkswagen bus and drove it uh, senior year. We drove it during spring break to Oregon, which we were in Virginia. So we drove across country together, uh, two you know, 17 year olds or whatever. And, um, had an amazing time. And when I got out to Oregon, uh, I saw Southern Oregon State College, which is now called Southern Oregon University, and uh, came back and I told my parents, if you want me to go to college, I'm going to go out there. And, uh, you know, I got to I got to commend them, you know, just I can't speak highly enough about these two, you know, they said, all right, you know, whatever it's going to take, uh, just like in, in high school, whatever it took me to keep in uh, keep me in school and keep me going. Uh, if I wanted to go to Oregon, that's where I was going to go. So, um, so I went to school out there. I didn't last long. I uh, struggled with many different various things and moved back east and uh, wound up going to the Corcoran School and Museum of uh, Art, which um, is now uh, owned by uh, George Washington or something. But, and I, I met there uh, a couple of great artists uh, uh, and a, a philosopher, uh, Bernard Welts, who really uh, had another, um, another wake up call for me, another inspiration. And so uh, all the while I was doing ceramics. And, um, you know, uh, funny enough, I, I think I knew exactly, you know, at the time, it was kind of like I had no idea what I wanted, but I think I knew exactly what I wanted. And um, I wound up going to four different undergraduate schools before <laughs> I uh, before I settled at uh, Northern Arizona University. Um, Were you seeking different things? Were you seeking, you know, was it was it about the art? And was it about studying with people you wanted to study with or was it was it something deeper that is for another show sometime i think you know like i think it was something really uh sort of much deeper i think it was you know like the uh proverbial um trying to find oneself um mm -hmm. you know uh you know i felt like i knew who exactly who i was but i wasn't quite ready to admit it or wasn't quite ready to uh, figure out where that was um where i fit into who i was and um I was restless, you know, I, um, you know, before I uh, ended up um, finishing college and I traveled cross country six times in that bus and up to Alaska and just uh, traveling the world and really enjoying myself. But focusing on art, um, you know, I, I worked in all different mediums that, you know, I studied airbrushing and etching and wood block printing and printmaking and um, jewelry and, but all the while, all of those were sort of electives because all the while I was doing 
uh, ceramics. But I remember um, it was, you know, at the Corcoran where, uh, you know, Bernard Welt was like, hey, you know, like, you don't fit in here, you know, and he wasn't, um, you know, he was being supportive and he was being uh, saying what exactly I needed to hear. You know, it's that kind of insightful mentorship I've had my entire life and it's just been really great. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so he said, you know, get out of here. My sister, um, you know, uh, I love her to death. Tony was uh, in Arizona and I discovered this school in Flagstaff. And uh, so I, I headed there at Northern Arizona University. Uh, and it is um, the best school for, or was when I was there, I'm sure it still is, the best school for undergraduate ceramics in the country, um, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, there I met some amazing artists, uh, Brian Harper, uh, who's been a lifelong friend and uh, supporter of this process. We really pushed each other at that school. And, and uh, you know, it was, it was really a phenomenal experience. Um, he, actually, he actually just pointed out that your, much of your art, uh, much of your ceramic work at, uh, in Arizona had painting and drawing on them. Uh, uh, so he's, uh, he's still a supporter. He's, he's here tonight. Yeah. Um, that's the only, that's the only reason I mentioned him. I, I knew he'd be here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. So there was a big influence. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I wasn't, I, you know, I painted, I never saw myself as a great painter. I certainly, certainly loved it while I was doing it, but you know, nothing ever really resonated uh, with me as something I was really super happy with or super proud of, but it was the inspiration, the images of other painters really became an inspiration and, and looking at what other painters were capturing or what other artists were capturing was something I tried to translate a lot early on. Well, you know, for a dozen or so years, what I really translated in my work and, um, you know, the painters like Modigliani, you know, somebody that was really influential uh, for me at the beginning. Um, and uh, my favorite painter is uh, Thomas Hart Benton. I, I, I know I mentioned uh, uh, Bob Ross earlier, but really Thomas Hart Benton has really been uh, an amazing inspiration. But anyway, so so yes, when I went to college, um, you know, it was just practice, 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 throw, 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 work, work, work. And um, I know we have a lot of ground to cover, but you know, something that uh, talks a little bit about my experience at, at, at Northern Arizona University is, um, I was hard to live with, so I didn't have a roommate. I lived by myself. I lived in the dorms until I was done. I learned very early on that dorm life is really good living. And uh, the cafeteria meal, meal plans is really the way to go. And so I had a, uh, my, own, my own room, which isn't much, wasn't much bigger than this library that I have now. Um, and I took the bunk beds and I took the beds off the floor. I lined the wall and floor with the tarp. And then I put the bunk beds on top of the tarp. And then uh, I put my wheel in there. Mm. I threw that way I could throw when I was at the studio I could throw all night long and I used the bunk beds as a as the drying racks for my for my clay work and I wrapped um, plastic all around them so it was a, you know a spectacular experience but I was really dedicated to really trying to um, you know figure it out you know really work hard on it it was just something and it, and it wasn't a struggle it was something fun and it came naturally and I think you know, ultimately, I mean, that's something lots of people talk about, but something I can totally take to heart and, and really believe in is, is um, you know, if you love what you do, that's never work. And, um, you know, there's something tr truth about, uh, some truth to that. And I, I think that, you know, it's really hokey when people say that. I know if, if I ever said that to my daughters, uh, Amelie and Finley, they'd probably just laugh at me. But it's, there's something, uh, you know, really uh, true about that, which, you know, is, is uh, something why I love working where I work now. And we'll get to that at a later part of the, the show. So I've got a question about when you were in Northern Arizona. So you, you said that was probably the best school uh, or is, is still the best school for ceramics. What, what makes, you know, we, we offer classes at the Arts Council and lots of people probably on the call this evening have, have taken art classes or have, have you know, spent time in art classes. So, so what makes uh, an art class or an experience at a university or at an institution, what makes it a good experience? Like what's, what's that look like? Really? Well, what, made, what made that so good for you? I think like you mentioned uh, a lot about what happens at the Arts Council of Princeton, um, you know, that community that's formed there, mm -hmm. um, you know, particularly in ceramics. And they're the, they're right now, besides our flamenco dancers, they're the only ones that are back in person. And uh, you know, there's this community that forms around this material that it's it's unexplainable. And you know, lots of people have tried to talk about it, but it's really unexplainable. So that you know, it's much like the Arts Council of Princeton in, in that sense. And so at Northern Arizona University, um, we had a good teacher. 
uh, we had several good teachers, um, uh, Paula, uh, Paula Rice, Ellen Tibbetts, and uh, most importantly, uh, my mentor, Don Bendel. And um, what he allowed is he allowed mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is not, uh, is sort of frowned upon and not really uh, supported um, by a lot of, uh, it's not like a, a teaching philosophy many people embrace. And that was something that he truly uh, embraced. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, if, you know, like you could load a kiln and everything would be wrong and he, he wouldn't say it and he'd allow everything to fail Mm. that you could learn and it's sort of like uh, tough love but it wasn't careless it was really uh it was an opportunity for you to really grow um and learn because you know he said if you if you don't make mistakes you don't learn and there's uh, mm. you know there's so much truth to that and what that really allowed is it allowed the students who were really i mean so what the what the issue with a teacher like don bendel is those people that are very uh, driven and very inspired and very passionate sort of really accelerate and really do amazing things. And, and those people that are maybe a little less thrilled about it, you know, don't, don't have that same experience and same job. So I think a lot of it has to do with, with the teacher. And then from the teacher, and it wasn't so much about teaching, like I said, I mean, you know, really, I can't remember ever seeing him teach me or ever see him demonstrate, you know, it was really about this community and engagement. And what that did was it brought a group of students together in a really meaningful and powerful way. And the group was just, you know, amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, people that were above us were helping the people below, right? So the seniors were helping the juniors and the juniors were helping the software. And it just created this real team-like effort. And uh, the other scenario, the other reason why I think it was such a good program is the facilities were fantastic. I mean, they, um, it wasn't state of the art, it just had everything. And uh, in particular, it had these uh, things uh, called wood kilns. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with ceramics, it uses wood as a fuel. It's a very old uh, firing technology. Um, and a lot of people are, are sort of doing it now, but it was, um, you know, really one of the first kilns, not the first, but one of the first uh, kilns of its kind in, in the States. And um, it took a team to do it. And that was, that's the really sort of interesting thing is that it sort of, it didn't devalue, but it decentralized the individual and really made it about a group, a team effort. And if everybody wasn't on board, and the reason I say that is because it took a week to fire the kiln. You had to be, you had to be there or somebody had to be there. A group of four people had to be there uh, 24 hours a day for those seven days, right? So wow. people were always there in teams helping out. And so um, your success depended on other people's participation. And so, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's all about teamwork and that really, you know, gave you a solid time with other people, gave you time to uh, get to know them, to, uh, to, to work with people and, you know, learn about teamwork and what it takes to, to get things done. And, and I think that's a large part of it. So I'm, besides the teacher, and I, you know, I don't always like to, um, you know, privilege the sort of a hierarchy of the way teaching works. Um, you know, I think teachers have a lot to learn from students, um, but really it was the, the attitude and philosophy that the, the pedagogy, I guess, of, of Don uh, that enabled, you know, an enormous amount of students to really succeed. And I gotta say, there's more, you know, it seems like there's more students that have succeeded in the field um, that, you know, had Bendel or took Bendel at some point, um, you know, and so that, I think that also speaks volume. So um, anyway. So, so out so of college uh, and, you know, I know you went to four different schools, I think you said, so was that a four year program, a five year program, an eight year program? It sounds like it may have been a little bit more than four years, I'm guessing, but I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, four and a half or five years. And yeah. I think it's a little shy of five years. And I think ultimately I made some really lucky decisions where a lot of my credits transferred. Great. Um, I spent three years at in Flagstaff and then uh, graduated. Um, so I guess all said, you know, four and a half, five years. And uh, I went to grad school, I applied to grad school. Uh, and that was something else, uh, Bendel. So I had really excelled, I thought, you know, really learned and excelled at the wood kiln, learning how to fire it, which is a whole different, you know, it's a whole different material, uh, you know, process uh, conversation. So, um, and I really, uh, you know, I think excelled at my, my wheel work and my sculpture, I, you know, I felt very comfortable with it. 
And, uh, you know, Bendel told me much different advice. He told other people, he said, okay, now you got to go to school where you don't have access to any of this stuff. Hmm. So he was like, you know, go to, go to a city, go to a school that doesn't have these kilns, go, you know, this, that, or, you know, try something completely different. And so I wound up going to uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, which is in Richmond, Virginia, and studied under some amazing people, Alan Rosenbaum, uh, Lydia Thompson, and, uh, you know, another real big, uh, two big mentors of mine, uh, uh, Morris Hirowski, but uh, most notably is um, uh, Howard. Um, Howard was uh, Rosati, sorry, was an amazing, amazing uh, mentor, but he was a philosopher and art critic. So that took me down a different road. But before I got to, um, before I left Northern Arizona and went to um, uh, Virginia, I spent a lot of time in Alaska. And, um, and we'll talk about, about that a little bit later, but I met another mentor, life changer of mine, uh, Dorica and Nathan Jackson and their son, Stephen and, and uh, Rebecca. So um, anyway, you can see a theme that sort of uh, runs through this whole uh, sh talk is, you know, people, mentors, teachers, parents, you know, I mean, the, um, you know, the system is there for success. And, and I can't thank all of those people um, you know, that have sacrificed so much uh, to allow me to be as selfish as I have been and continue to be. My wife, Rachel, and my two kids, oh, they let me get away with anything I want. But anyway, um, so- Back to grad school, back to grad school. Back to grad school. Uh, so Virginia Commonwealth University and, uh, and there, you know, I was um, hit over my head in a uh, existential crisis like I have never seen before. And what this woke me up to was I had spent my life at this point making, 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 you know, material, craft, you know, physical work, you know, like sort of muscle memory, um, you know, carpentry, per welding, perfection, you know, like this kind of um, sense of, of material and, and uh, ability and virtuosity was something that was ingrained in me. And, um, you know, no, you know, I, going back to high school, never read a book. You know, I, I, I didn't read a book um, cover to cover. My parents used to pay me a, a quarter a page and I didn't, never read, hated reading. Um, I should tell you that I graduated with a special di diploma from high school. Uh, high school, because I took three periods of um, ceramics, those two, I didn't have to take a language or a math. So I graduated with a slightly different degree. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's legit, but anyway. Um, uh, so uh, in, in, in school, when I went there, uh, it was considered a uh, postmodern school, right? Which, um, you know, if you're familiar with the uh, Paul Robeson building, uh, you know, it's a, a sort of postmodern architect. But, um, you know, Tim can tell you about postmodern architecture better than I can. But anyway, so it was sort of a postmodern school. So I went from what some people would say was a modernist school, which was heavy on uh, abstract expressionism and, uh, you know, making, to a uh, postmodern sort of theoretical school um, where it privileged sort of the mental versus the physical. Hmm. And that was a, that was a, real, uh, a real mind bender for me. I remember, um, you know, I went to school, I went to the studio, I cleaned, I moved everything out. I made, I don't know, in the first couple of weeks I'd made, you know, not a hundred, but like dozens and dozens of monumental sort of ceramic sculpture, you know, uh, felt very important. I, you know, I felt like, wow, look at me, I'm, I'm doing amazing things, pounding my chest, you know. And so I had this uh, this group critique with sculpture and painting students, and and they they came in, and David McQueen and Gallo Moncayo and James Busby. These are three uh, three people who and and Ron Johnson. Those are three people who who stood up for me, and we became friends. But basically, we were at this critique, and we had just spent um, two like two hours up in this other guy's studio before we came to mine. It was a seminar class, and and this this guy had nothing but uh, Xerox paper on the wall of questions, like one through 5,000. It's just one question sort of led to another. We were in there talking about this guy's work for, for hours. And, and I was like, wow, if they think this is good, when they come down to my studio, it's gonna be a total mind bender. So, um, so I was all excited. We got to my studio, crickets. And mm. uh, foolishly, I thought, wow, I've blown them away that they don't even know what to say. And, uh, and so, um, you know, people started hemming and hawing and, and uh, you know, my friend Gallo, well, my friend now, Gallo said, um, why don't we talk about, you know, line and color? And the guy whose room we were just in said, bullshit, I'm not gonna talk shop. And 
it sort of took me aback. I had no I, no frame of reference. I had no understanding of, of what they were seeing or what they weren't seeing or what I wasn't understanding or what I wasn't seeing. So that was a wake up call that um, not that I was wrong or not that they were right, but there was a, a language I didn't really understand and, and um, a way to talk about art, to think about art, to make art that I was um, really unaware of. And I had no, you know, like I think I'd taken one art history class in, in undergraduate school. So I had uh, no understanding of art since, you know, after 1945, essentially. So I was um, really thrown, you know, thrown to the wolves. And it was really, um, you know, it's disconcerting. Steve uh, Robinson was my a teacher and, and um, there as well. And uh, we went out to the bar, this, this place in Virginia called Chacas and uh, had some sandwiches and a lot of beers and we talked and it really was um, a great experience but a great motivator for me to up my game and do a lot of research. So now I read um, uh, and uh, do a lot of time, uh, spent a lot of time reading and trying to uh, come from a place where I could have a conversation with these, with these people. So it's really understand where they're coming from so that I could better understand what I was doing and articulate that. So, so after all of this, you know, at some point you started getting an interest, I guess, in arts administration and, and other things. So you sort of wound your way through and found yourself in New York, uh, you know, managing uh, and working in a, in a very important ceramics and, and art institution in New York. So tell us about how that sort of came to be. And uh, then we're going to jump in in about three or four minutes into some of your work. I want to go to some of your work. So, hey. so how did you come to New York and the arts administration and, and sort of what was that experience like? So um, uh, Howard Rosati once told me, he said, sometimes uh, the best decisions in life you make are decisions other people make for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had applied to, uh, I don't know, 30 colleges to get a teaching job out of, uh, out of uh, uh, graduate school. Uh, no luck. And I was, uh, I was uh, seeing this amazing woman. Uh, her name was Rachel, or is Rachel. And she had graduated and moved to uh, New York City. And I joked, I said, you know, I'm never going, you know, as an artist, I'm never going to New York City. New York City is where artists go to die. And, uh, and what I mean by that is sort of become, a, you know, it's like you're a tiny minuscule fish in an amazingly large ocean. And it's like, you know, it seems like a terrible place to go and try to be an artist. Um, but I wound up following her up there and, uh, you know, I was spending time in Alaska. And when I spent time in Alaska, when I came back, I didn't have to work cause I had, you know, made money and saved money. So I became a tourist. So when I, I moved up there, uh, uh, to live with her in Brooklyn, I, um, would travel around the city sightseeing and, and having a great time and, um, you know, live the dream. And so, uh, she would come home from work and, and one day, uh, and I would tell her how great New York was and all these great places I saw. And oh, here I was at the Statue of Liberty. I was, I was up at the Cloisters, you know. And uh, she came home one day and goes, hey, I found you a job. And uh, it was uh, as secretary at, at a place called Greenwich House Pottery. And that was in 2003. And I applied and I got the job. And uh, that's, where it, that's where it started. And so I was with uh, Greenwich House for uh, 17 years and uh, worked my way up to a uh, director. But um, before I got there, I spent, um, I spent three years uh, as, or two and a half years as this position I called secretary for the students. It's called a student liaison. I was the first, I should mention that. Um, it's called student liaison. It's basically essentially the secretary for the students. And um, what this did was that it really allowed me to get a, a really in-depth understanding of what the students were there for, what the students wanted, what the students needed, um, what they cared about, you know, and, and funny enough, or interestingly enough, as is probably all the, always the case everywhere all the time, is what the administration sort of thought and what the students thought are very different things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there was a big disconnect between uh, what the, what the um, sort of administration thought should be happening and, and was making happening. And it was sort of counter uh, to um, sort of the philosophy of what the students were, what the community was. And uh, this time with the students uh, really, and you know, as an administrator there, um, it was you know, not really administration, you know, a little data entry, but um, really got me inspired about the possibilities of, of what it could be uh, to uh, both be an administrator be an artist and be working with this amazing, I mean, the, the people at this 
at, at Greenwich House were just amazing. The, the, the depth of understanding, the richness of their lives, uh, what kind of jobs they hold. I mean, it's just this weird concophony of amazing, amazing people, lifelong friends I've, I've made there. Um, but anyway, so working, working as the secretary really got me understanding about what the students wanted and what they, what they needed. Plus I had a background in the field, something the administ other administrators really hadn't. Um, so I love ceramics. I spent my life dedicated to ceramics. And, um, you know, and, and I was listening to what the students were sort of wanting and what they needed. And so I think ultimately that gave me a great perception of, of you know, the possibility of how to run it, you know, like uh, give the people sort of what they want. And, um, and so I, uh, you know, taught at the same time. I did construction, this great guy, uh, uh, David Packer and Margaret Manzetta got me a job uh, doing some construction work, which helped pay some bills. Um, I was teaching at, um, I don't even know, uh, Kingsborough Community College and somewhere in, in Jersey. And uh, then, you know, got the, uh, you know, the director left and uh, I became the uh, assistant director. And uh, three years later, I became the director. And so, you know, that whole time, it gave me the, like I said, you know, it gave me a perception of, of, of what a community was, what it was like to work within a community, what it was like to be a member of that community. And, um, you know, like it gave me an appreciation and the ability or the inability to listen and to think about what it, what it was, what my act, how my actions might affect the community. And so that was, um, that's not to say that I always do what they want and always listen to what they want, but it, it was a way for me to, uh, you know, really balance, I think, uh, balance the scale between all out administration, all out business and sort of running the business. And you were teaching, uh, you were always teaching classes. You weren't sort of uh, in an ivory tower kind of situation. You were actually teaching most of the time as well. Yeah. So uh, besides teaching there, um, I also taught at universities and community colleges, but I always taught there. And the only hiatus I took was when I became director for the first couple of years I didn't teach. Mm -hmm. But what, what I noticed, and this was a self-revelation, um, not that important, that's to me that sounds too important, but what I noticed is when I went into the studio to do something one day, I noticed something that was a little off and I was like, wait a minute, you know, I'm kind of removed from what's going on here. You know, I really don't, you know, I'm not in tune like I used to be. Mm -hmm. So I started to, uh, teaching again so that I could, um, you know, ing ingrain myself more into, you know, what the students were doing and what they were seeing. and. You know, I, I sort of, within those two years, because I was so self, uh, you know, so consumed in the administration, I, I lost um, some sight of what mm -hmm. I needed to have a sight on. And, and um, so, yeah, so, you know, I think teaching was something that was necessary. I, I believe it for me, I'm not saying for all administrators, but for me, it's, it's absolutely necessary, um, you know, to, to, to embed myself within the, within the group so that I, you know, can, you know, have that same compassion. You know, essentially, it's hard to have compassion for people if you're removed entirely. I like building that community and having hands on. I mean, you mentioned your, a couple times your dad was hands on. I mean, I think you you want to be hands on because that's sort of how you have that connectivity. Uh, let's let's pop to some of your work. So I'm going to share my screen here and um, take a look at some of your work, and you sort of take us through some of this. So I hope everybody should be able to see this. Can you see this, Adam? I can see it. I can see it. And this Great is awesome. As so I talk about the piece. Uh, these two pieces. All right, great. So this is um, what I would call from the archives, from the from the very depths of my um, uh, ceramic being. So this was on the the one on the left, the uh, white and green and brown rimmed uh, vessel. This was you know, about nine inches tall, wheel thrown, uh, and this I made in high school. Uh, this I made at my uh, senior year of of school, and it really. Um, I, I've sort of regressed in my ability since then. Like I can't throw as, this is really thin and really lightweight. Nowadays, everything I make is something that you use to hold a table down in a windstorm. But, um, you know, this is, um, you know, really influenced. And, you know, I, I gotta say, you know, like just as much as every teacher has been an inspiration, somebody that's driven me, um, you know, I'm not one to, um, shy away from the fact that this was probably an exact replica of something that uh, my teacher had made. Um, uh, you know, it's a 
sort of a, I, I mean, I guess every potter has probably made something that looks identical to this. Uh, the proportions, I feel like I still look at it and I think the proportions are pretty good. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, neck might be a little, the, the, the lips uh, might be a little wide for me. Um, but you know, the glaze, the way it breaks looks pretty good at, um, you know, it's cone six oxidation. So it doesn't have that same, um, you know, feeling of warmth and glaze penetration quite like the other one, the one on the right, which, um, so one was done in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. The other one was done at the Corcoran School and Museum of Fine Art. Oops, let me go back to that. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll stick right. Sorry about that. Well, it's uh, you know, it's you can see it's uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite like this this proportion. This was uh, you know, before Instagram existed, but totally looks like an Instagram shot. And this is another great example of of you know, classic what not to do, but never getting training. Uh, photographing your work outside in nature on a log, it's just like oh, painful to to look at, but. Uh, it's great now, like memory lane. But um, anyway, so, uh, you know, you can see the influence is carried through. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. Next couple yeah. of us. This is sort of a pairing. Yeah, so this is actually just like a sort of front and back view or side and side, right. uh, mm -hmm. same same piece. And this was, uh, you know, um, arrog arrogantly um, named uh, the, the Bride Schritt Bear by her bachelors. And this was a, um, a Duchampian reference. Uh, it was just like, you know, I thought I was a conceptual artist. But anyway, so this is uh, what you would uh, consider, you know, very heavily influenced by Japanese ceramics, uh, wood-fired uh, porcelain work that I made. These are probably, I don't know, 12 inches or so uh, tall and uh, fired in the wood kiln. So you can see the difference between the work that you just looked at and this work. This has uh, what you call flashing. If you notice the, uh, the orange and um, you know, uh, salmon colors, and then the drips is the wood ash from the, uh, from the kiln where you throw uh, wood as the fuel. There's no glaze on these. So all of the color that you see there is uh, developed from uh, the intense heat and flame and ash oh. in the kiln. That's amazing. I've never seen that. So is, does it vary by what wood you use as well? Or is it, what's the influence of that? Absolutely. So, oh. so the, the, the literature on this is vast. There's conferences dedicated to wood firing ceramics. It's, I mean, the, the, like, I'm so, f I'm removed now from it, but I love wood firing. I haven't wood fired in forever, but uh, one of the best wood fires, by the way, uh, is I hope on the call tonight, uh, a guy named Sam Johnson, I'm, I'm using his uh, cups here tonight. Anyway, um, these are also wood fired. You can see no glaze. Um, but anyway, so uh, yes, what kind of wood you use makes a profound difference. Uh, but it depends on who you ask. Like Sven Bear, the potter I, I told you about that inspired me that was in England, uh, who I went to go visit later on. I, I uh, saved up some money. Funny story about that between Brian Harper and myself um, trying to raise money. But anyway, um, went to go visit him and he uses two different styles of wood one at the first uh, part of the firing and one towards the end. Mm -hmm. one, uh, one wood left what he calls black ash. Yeah. The other wood uh, laid down like a white ash. And uh, we used a lot of pine uh, where we were because we were in uh, Flagstaff. It's the largest pine or, ponderosa pine forest in the world. And uh, so an abundant source of, of pine. So we used a lot of that. And I had a lot of uh, green um, uh, hues to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the heat. Right, so just like if you're a, a wood stove uh, user, uh, the kind of wood you use has a big profound, you know, you're not supposed to use pine, it burns really hot and very sappy, I mean, very pitchy and creosote buildup, uh, whereas hardwoods uh, burn uh, sort of less hot and slower. Um, so, so yes, what wood you use can have a profound effect. In fact, Sam, who I mentioned earlier, Sam Johnson, uses wet wood. Uh, so there's a, there's a discrepancy between the uh, dry wood versus wet wood. He uses wet wood. He, um, like they even soak wood in water to make it even more wet. And there's a philosophy behind that, that the, the hydrogen when heated and separated from the water molecules, um, you know, in the steaming process, actually uh, fly through the kiln, penetrate the work and, and clean it. Now I'm probably, I'm probably damaging that whole philosophy. <clears throat> Maybe I dreamt it, but that was um, that was something that um, you know, uh, besides wet and dry wood, uh, whatever kind of wood you use makes a difference. How you stack the how you stack the kiln, uh, how you stack the wood in the kiln makes a difference. I mean, how you stack the ware in the kiln makes a difference. Moving so on. now I think we're probably in Alaska, is my guess. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that maybe we're in Alaska. But am I right or am I wrong? You're wrong. 
Oh, I thought I had it. But, but very close. So I spent on and off eight years in Alaska and um, I uh, studied and lived with uh, Nathan and Dorica Jackson. Uh, Nathan is uh, one of the uh, prized uh, Clinkett uh, totem pole carvers, master carver, Clinkett master carver in, in Ketchikan, Alaska. And uh, when I was in Northern Arizona University, I did a research paper in my jewelry class and came across his jewelry mm. and learned that he's also a carver and uh, was really inspired. You know, one of the reasons I went to um, uh, Arizona, I didn't mention this, but you know, I had my, uh, you know, time where I felt very akin to uh, Native American culture. And so I wanted to go spend a little time out in Arizona. And um, so I was really fascinated uh, with the uh, Northwest Coast um, uh, natives. And so I, I reached out to uh, Nathan and said, you know, I'm fascinated. Oh, and I read in this book, um, that he takes non-native apprentices. So I thought, well, you know, like I'll give it a shot. So I emailed the visitor center. This is kind of a funny story. I, um, I emailed the visitor center. I said, hey, you know, does this guy, Nathan Jackson, is he still alive? You know, like I read about him in a book. They said, yeah, here's his phone number. And they gave me his phone number. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I called him up and, uh, you know, I said, uh, I had already bought the plane ticket. I bought a plane ticket to go visit him. And I called him up and I said, hey, can I come visit? And he was like, Sure. I was like, good, because I already bought the ticket, you know. Um, and so he met me at the uh, airport. I spent a week with him and his wife there. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, hey, can I come back and you know, an apprentice with you? And he says, well, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not going to work. I don't work with not native apprentices. And I was like, oh, God, you can't believe everything you read, you know. Um, but, uh, but you can come and watch and you can study and you can learn, you know. And so I spent the summer up there. And I got a job at night. I was working at a grocery store, stocking shelves from midnight to 8 a.m. And then I would drive home or dr drive back to their house and uh, meet up with Nathan. I, and I'd go to the carving shed with him at the Saxman Native Village and, um, and watch him carve. And so all summer long, I pretty much just um, in my Volkswagen bus, I, I went up there and, and uh, you know, watched him, how to, watched him carve, read all the literature, read all the books, learned about the symbols and the famous carvers and, you know, what the myths and what the stories were and a little bit about the culture. And um, he gave me some small tasks to do, a lot of wood splitting, a lot of uh, wood chopping while I was there, but I was used to it because of uh, the uh, wood firing ceramics. And um, uh, also, too, I got a great story um, before I talk about this poll in particular is uh, Brian Harper, who I mentioned earlier, uh, drove up to visit uh, visit me and uh, just showed up one day unannounced um, uh, while I was there. So, uh, you know, I know the, the the power of community and the power of people and, and friendship is, is uh, worth saying over and over again. But anyway, so this project is Zurich, Switzerland, actually. Hmm. So um, after eight years of carving with Nathan, I had, um, you know, grown pretty good at it. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, knew a thing or two. And so he invited me to uh, come to the museum, the Rietberg Museum in Zurich, and um, and help him carve this pole. Uh, his son Nate, uh, Stephen also worked on it, and a couple other carvers. But uh, I met I met them in Zurich. I stayed with uh, them for I think about three weeks in Zurich, and I we all lived in the museum. We lived in. I, I slept in the kitchen. I slept in the kitchen in the museum. And uh, it was an amazing experience. The people there were so generous. Every night, uh, so we carved on this on this wood this wood uh, floor you see here uh, with the totem laying down. It was fenced. I was um, uh, uh, tented in, so it was all tented. And uh, visitors came by all day long and uh, watched us work. Uh, they thought I was the interpreter, um, so they'd always uh, speak to me in uh, Swiss German. Um, sprechen Sie Deutsch. I just kind of smiled. Um, anyway, so um, uh, we carved it there for the museum, and it was an amazing experience. But like every day, people would come by, say, "Hey, come to come to our house for dinner." We would all go to their house for dinner, and it would be fondue. I mean, it was just like they all wanted you to have this traditional meal. It's like, forget, it, I'm going to McDonald's. You know, like I can't <laughs> do this anymore. You know, how large is this piece? I can't really sense the dimension of this. What's the? This is 28 feet. Wow. So it's uh, 28 feet. Wow. Uh, I come up. I come up a little bit higher than her hands at the very. So you're, moment. you're right in here somewhere. Yeah, I'm right, right. In here. exactly. Um, so this is, um, this is the Raven Fog uh, Fog Woman um, uh, totem pole, and um, 
yeah the, so they had a what they called the indiana uh indiana museum which is the museum of of, of american indians and mm -hmm. they actually had it you know it's funny they actually had it before uh the smithsonian opened up the american uh museum of american indian in 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 dc so it's kind of interesting that the uh swiss uh the swiss had a museum before uh we did here but anyway so we carved that and um you know we're like i said i think we were there three weeks it was an amazing experience and just for just for reference it um i don't know it probably takes about a, a you could carve about a foot a week um you know just uh so but so a lot of it was carved before it even shipped. So, so you know, because we couldn't finish it all uh, while living there. And yeah. one of the things that I should touch on since we're looking at this uh, piece I made here is, is you know, I, I was very forthright with Nathan. Um, you know, I was, um, I had no interest in becoming a totem pole carver. Mm -hmm. I had uh, no interest in, um, you know, continuing on. I just, I just loved him. I loved his family. I loved the art. I loved studying it and I loved doing it. I loved working with him, but it wasn't something I wanted to do on my own. Um, and so the, 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 I did a couple of pieces that were inspired. That was the, the next piece. And the yeah. there. that was um, uh, a piece that was inspired by my time there. Um, I just did, uh, you know, I, less than, less than a dozen pieces that were really inspired a directly derivative of of my time and experience with with him over that you know decade and um but it's it, but i love it and that was coil built that's about a two and a half foot tall piece by two feet wide uh coil built not not potter's wheel but uh, anyway so 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 i uh you know i started with pots and uh you know uh went to graduate school so this here that you're seeing is fills into that story that I was tell, telling you about, um, the two platters here, the, the story about the wake up experience. So this was the kind of work I was doing um, at the time. And it was, you know, it's very, you know, it's derivative in a sense, you know, it was uh, mm -hmm. the colored platter is, uh, you know, Motherwell, uh, Robert Motherwell meets uh, uh, Rudy Audio meets, um, you know, Picasso or what, you know, what have you. and. Um, you know, really bright abstract color um, work that I felt was me moving past one of the uh, big personalities. It feels like every, you know, every person that goes to graduate school back when I was going to graduate school and before they were um, uh, sort of um, mimicking uh, the abstract expressionist, the, the Peter Volkuses of the world. And so this was my moving past uh, Volkus, but not really. So these big platters, it's about 24 inches for reference, probably weighs 60 pounds so quite thick you could the rim is about two inches thick yeah. um so quite heavy. i love the piece on the right the one on the right um is uh adam welch's perfectly average chino so i invented this glaze um and i invented it because i averaged i took the i took 20 uh like 20 glazes of chino so i love chino everybody who knows me uh knows i love this glaze called chino I have a little song that I sing uh, uh, typically when I'm teaching people how to glaze, um, which I won't I won't say now. It will bring tears to people's eyes. It's so <laughs> but anyway, so uh, Shino is a type of glaze. Um, you know, largely it used to be just like white and gray, but now and this is white and gray. But nowadays it's you know sort of black to gray to orange to everything in in, in between. So this is the glaze I invented, uh, just taking all their glaze recipes and adding it together and finding the average. Um, and then, so that's how I came up with it. So that's not really my invention. And then what you see here is um, kind of a shift that's taking place uh, in the work from very colorful, very decorative, very um, sort of, uh, you know, drawing expressionist, like Brian said, like this was sort of the, how I draw on it to a lot more about the glaze. And then this is uh, severed. So I would cut the plate and then reattach it with um, this uh, thick slip. So it's sort of, um, you know, it's not, you know, uh, daring or anything like that. But, you know, a lot of people um, don't show the slip, but I, I let it uh, show and I was really inspired by uh, masonry. It's sort of like what you call good squish, you know, it's like, you know, you got, you know, you got a good um, sort of joint when the, the, the mortar starts to, to bleed out. So that led to this kind of work, right? So um, this, this, these bricks and holding down a table in a storm, I think is the way you yes. refer to it. And we're going to, we're going to spend about five more minutes on your work and then we're going to shift to the Arts Council. Great. So, um, so 
I was in Richmond, Virginia, and you know, I was uh, really starting to be impacted by my uh, life there. Uh, you know, all bricks around me. I was really affected by uh, the the work I was looking at and the uh, the literature I was reading, uh, the profound teachers I had. Um, you know, I uh, like I mentioned Howard Rosati and Morris Urowski critical theory took uh, precedent. So art history started to come in. So, you know, I was inspired by minimalism and paring down everything into some sort of essential item, you know, it's very um, heavy theoretical based. And, um, and then did that, I still make bricks by the way, and I know we have to go through this. So um, we'll go to the next slide. So I still work in bricks and this was my sort of exposure to, to bricks, but I never left pottery and I still work in pottery uh, today. There's something so satisfying and so rewarding. These are two uh, pots that I've made, I don't know, uh, you know, five or so years ago, a pitcher and a, and a vase. And um, uh, the next work is something else that I I'll have to save for another time. But this is um, Empty Bull Project. Empty Bull is a very famous uh, project that's done since the 90s, started in the Midwest by a high school teacher. Um, who had her kids uh, make a bunch of bowls and they sold them for, I don't know, five bucks and filled them with chili and raised money for a uh, food pantry. And so mm -hmm. I work in my town and I've worked in uh, Princeton as well. I live in Heightstown for the Heightstown Cultural Arts Commission. Me and Anne Marie and the commission have done some really great uh, things, raised a lot of money in the last five years, over $55,000. Awesome yeah. Um, then we have here the Martha Stewart bricks. So I, um, I kept going with the bricks and I was inspired by, well, I was critical of, but grew to love Martha Stewart. So this is all 280 of her paints. So she had a paint. <laughs> this reminds me of my, of my ninth grade art class with the art teacher having us paint the color wheels. So I was, I was, I was again wrong. So this is Martha Stewart's colors. That's awesome. Honestly, that was all really 280, awesome. all 280. And I was, I was um, critical at first, but very inspired by her sort of the way she laid out the, the, the it reminded me of the uh, picture theory of, uh, of meaning, you know, it's a uh, sort of Wittgensteinian uh, sort of philosophy, but um, a really critical, but really grew to love it. And, um, and I was inspired for, uh, you know, several years by her paints and uh, started to explore other um, ways to, so this is actually house paint on the bricks, whereas later on some of the images uh, that we have is um, actually the, the brick is uh, tinted all the way through. This is uh, New Zealand porcelain. It's a uh, uh, kale. This is beautiful. This is really an awesome piece. I, I love this piece. Is this, is this the size of a brick or what's the size of this, the scale? It's, it's a little bit bigger. This is eight, eight by four uh, by three. So it's a little smaller, but thicker and taller. And uh, this was really another pivotal moment for me. This was um, when this brick came out and I had about a hundred come out of this firing all done the exact same way. Uh, I knew this is probably one of the best pieces I've ever made. Mm -hmm. And there was something that just conveyed so like none of the other ones look like, it. you know, they're just, it sort of conveyed everything about brickness to me. And um, I, I the piece, it's, uh, this picture is good, but it doesn't do it justice. It's like the, the porcelain glows. It's hard to explain. It's almost like sugar, you know? It's almost like some sort of confection. It looks like a baked good. It looks like a baked, you know, it looks like a beautiful pound cake or something. I, I, you know, and those stones are uh, Cape Cod, uh, stones from the beaches of Cape Cod. And so I sort of wedged them into this um, uh, kale and concoction. Uh, and fired it and it just the way it, it breaks and the cracks and just everything about it sort of like to me it was like the um, the atlas of of sort of all humanity you know it's just kind of like it, it it conveys sort of everything in me to me everything about being human I don't know why but it just does okay so uh, we had a couple of questions here um, let me um, uh, I think we've answered one of the questions. Um, someone asked a question, is it a reactive glaze? So I'm not quite sure what they might've been referring to or which piece, but it was probably around five minutes ago. So they were asking about a reactive glaze. Yeah, it was probably the Chino. It was probably the Adam Welch uh, perfectly average Chino. And, and the, the splotches you see, the little uh, dots that you see in that. So it's like white and gray, but the dots were sort of blackish looking. 
um, that is, it's reactive to the atmosphere. So that's a sort of reaction that happens with carbon in uh, the kiln, uh, generally to do with reduction. It's, it's uh, you know, scientific stuff, but you know, it's, it, you know, you could spend your whole life studying this, uh, this stuff. But yeah, it's very reactive in the kiln and it, it really matters entirely about the firing. If that piece is fired in a different kiln in a different way, it'll be, it could be all tan and beige. Uh, or it could be solid black. So it, you know, it's all to do with the firing. So it's um, you gotta you gotta hope for the best. So um, so someone else asked the experience of Arizona and Greenwich and the enduring support of your parents sound like a wonderfully fertile environment to grow your passion uh, for clay. How ethnically diverse were those environments, and how much were you influenced by cultural diversity at the institutions where you studied or administered? So. Um, you know, as I as I talked a little bit about, you know, my uh, deep interest in uh, Native American uh, cultures, and so I was fortunate to be immersed in those cultures when I was in those locations. Um, you know, Flagstaff is uh, Northern Country. Uh, I, you know, it was sort of um, not terribly diverse. There was a you know a large Native population there, but it wasn't terribly diverse. Uh, where I grew up, I was uh, fortunate that it was pretty diverse. Um, well. That's not exactly fair to say. There was three or four, you know, different large uh, populations uh, there. So it wasn't like it had hundreds of different, uh, you know, populations, uh, people there. But it was really, um, you know, I feel like uh, my high school experience, I was very fortunate uh, that it, it, was a, it was a school of, um, I don't know what the percentage, percentages would be, it was, but it was a very diverse school. So that was um, really great. You know, like I said, it was uh, Northern Virginia. So it, you know, it definitely had a suburb, but it definitely had a lot of military and, you know, it was, um, you know, close enough to the city where, you know, people were still living in that area. So I'd say that was, um, you know, fairly, fairly diverse. And Richmond, oh, Richmond is it's sort of half black and half white. There's really nobody else there. Uh, it's a very bizarre um, uh, experience uh, when I lived in Richmond. Um, so, but that's a good question. And, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, it, um, it's not, uh, certainly my life hasn't been the token of, 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 um, you know, of, of diversity. So, so, um, so let's talk now, just, uh, I want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. So let's talk now about a very important chapter in your life, uh, which is joining the Arts Council of Princeton. Uh, I'm happy to acknowledge that I was on the search committee with a number of other really dedicated Arts Council of Princeton supporters um, to, to find the next executive director. And we, we did the interview process through the COVID-19. So it was early days of Zoom. So I think we started sort of uh, in the middle of March or maybe the late part of March. And so it was a very unusual experience to be interviewing people. So, so just, you know, in, in, in four or five minutes, uh, let's, uh, let's just tell us about why were you attracted to the Arts Council of Princeton and what do you want to accomplish, you know, as a new executive director? So as, as Maria said, I had shown a couple of times, I've been at teaching at the uh, Princeton University for uh, 10 years now. So I, I was familiar with Princeton. I, uh, Princeton, I live in Heightstown, so it's just a few miles away. So I had exhibited twice at the Arts Council. Uh, a friend of mine, TJ Erdahl, was a resident there. Uh, so I had met Maria uh, there on a couple of occasions. I was really struck by the professionalism. I was struck by mm -hmm. the, uh, the architecture. I loved, you know, downtown Princeton. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, walking around the studios, I got a little tour when I was there. Uh, Jeff Nathanson was still the director then. Um, and I was walking around, I, I said, man, this is really, I, the studios were great. The building was fantastic. You know, there seemed to be a lot of energy there. And I was like, wow, that's a really good place, you know? And I turned to my wife and I said, you know, um, and this was, I don't know, 12 years ago. So this was a long time ago. I said, wow, this would be, you know, a great job. I'd love to work at this place, you know, like um, kind of like a dream job, you know? And then I showed again and, uh, you know, I just uh, would hear about it, see some shows because I was at the university. It's only a walk down the street. I'd see some shows there. And, you know, I thought to myself, wow, this would be, this would, this is, there's so much exciting energy here and uh, so much activity and, and uh, you know, opportunity that seemed to be happening that I thought wow, this would be the one place that I would consider leaving uh, what I thought was sort of my forever job. Mm. Um, and so uh, when the job came up, I was, uh, I was told by two different people that this job was available. Um, one is Emery Miller, who's with Our Pride New Jersey. Um, she's also with me on the Heights Town Cultural Arts Commission, a great person. And uh, the other was uh, Ross Wischek, uh, who uh, rest, uh, 
wish I'm ruining that name. I'm damaging. I'm sorry. Um, and he uh, he worked for Sen or he he operates uh, Sen Hunger Pack in Princeton. They both knew how much I loved Princeton, how much I liked the Arts Council, how interested I was in the job. And they both said, "Hey, by the way, this job is up." And this was back in December. Um, so this was pre-COVID. Um, and so I went to the website. I looked around. I didn't need a job. You know, I had a, I had a, uh, you know, a steady job, a great job. And, uh, and, uh, but I looked and I was like, you know what? I, I like, I like what they do. I like the, the breadth of programming, um, you know, the performing arts, the visual arts, of course, ceramics. They got a gallery, a residency, public art component. They do all of this outreach, you know, like, and I was really, as I told you with Empty Bowls, I started getting more and more interested in, in food-based charity work, but mostly, you know, like, uh, the home fund program that, um, you know, with the arts exchange program we do with uh, Trenton at the Arts Council. So these things were really compelling and really interesting. So the more I read about it, I was like, man, this seems to uh, really start to align with a lot of the things that I've, I've started to appreciate more in my life. And then something else occurred to me. Um, I, I loved New York. I loved all the people I was meeting there. I loved my job, but I spent all my time and energy and effort developing and working for a community that my kids and my wife and I weren't a part of when I left. And I thought to myself, what, like now that I'm spending time focusing on my own community with empty bowls and part of the Heights Town Cultural Arts Commission, I said, I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like I'm not giving everything I should be giving or could be giving. And so the Arts Council of Princeton is an opportunity for me to work within my own community for my own community. Uh, something that my family, my children, my two daughters and my wife could take part in, um, you know, with, with the flamenco classes. Like I love hearing the flamenco. I, I gotta tell you, the dancing <laughs> happens right above my office and it is, it, it stops, stops me in my tracks. It's absolutely breathtaking. It's like, it's a calming peacefulness to me anyway. And then, you know, it's got a, it's got a great ceramic program, uh, you know, a lot of really engaged uh, students. So, so, you know, it was seemed like, you know, okay, this is, you know, it's got all this great stuff. And then, you know, COVID hit and I was like, this is crazy. Okay. I haven't heard from anybody, you know, like they must have given it to somebody else. And then like COVID I'm home working from home. I get a call. Hey, let's interview. I'm just like, what, how could anybody be even thinking about it right now? You know? And you know, having spent that time, uh, you know, with my family, I've never, I mean, the best, I hate to say it, best year of my life. I, I never having so much time with the kids, so much time with my wife, working at home has just been a really, it's been a moving experience to be able to spend this kind of quality time. I mean, and it has been quality time with my family and, and it's been really moving. And, 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 you know, and then all of a sudden to be able to work you know, just nine miles away, um, you know, in my own community. It's like, you know, it is without a doubt. A Your dream. dream. It's a dream. It's so, a dream. So, so let's fast forward. We're going we're gonna to ask Maria to join us in a second. So let's fast forward. Uh, my final question, I've got a couple more though that I want to that I want to ask that have been coming in. So they're really great questions. So let's sort of fast forward and it's two years from now. It's three years from now. You know, what's, what's, what's accomplished? What's been accomplished? What's, you know, and I know it's early months, you know, being at the Arts Council, so a bit of an unfair question, but, you know, what's, what's it look like? What's it, what have you done? What have you accomplished? What's different? What's the same, you know, uh, in a couple of minutes? We're in the black. Everything's great. Um, okay. No, I'm, I'm talking, you know, like there's been a, a, a push, recent push uh, to, towards more public art. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the staff has been absolutely amazing. Maria, who's on this call, um, you know, they've been uh, doing uh, murals. And um, now that I'm there, it's like, you know, I'm so stoked about it. Uh, so I can see, uh, you know, much uh, bigger, deeper uh, reach into public art around the municipality, even beyond. Um, so I think that's something that, you know, um, is really of excitement to me, really of interest, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, developing the classes. I think that we've got great classes, but, you know, I'd like to see, you know, more activity, more engagement. Um, and the outreach is just phenomenal, but I think we can even do more. You know, I, I think that uh, the staff works, you know, exceptionally hard, 
but and and they do so much for so many people but i think you know there's still there's still more outreach we can do even within our own neighborhood i think that um you know i'm working with um you know uh, veronica and john on the board um you know with the neighborhood community and there's so many people you know and it sort of surprised me about you know in princeton that there's so many people in need and so um many underserved uh, un underserved uh, children and and it just like to me it was like a you know a mind bender and so um you know a beefed up outreach program uh you know is something that i'm, I'm definitely interested in and you know just an engagement more across New Jersey. And not to say this stuff doesn't exist. I don't want to pretend like, you know, all of this, all of these things haven't been talked about and haven't been done. Um, but, you know, I'm really excited, you know, having, you know, working in, in Heights or living in Heightstown and being involved in Princeton is, is I could see possibilities for expanding and I can see possibilities to, to reach uh, beyond, uh, not to leave, but to reach beyond, uh, you know, um, the town and, and really, um, you know, attract more people from, you know, our, just our Mercer County, just more people uh, engaged from Mercer County. So ultimately, I think, um, you know, those are some of the things I, I really am looking forward to um, developing a little bit, uh, rebuilding some of our performing arts uh, program, programming. And, and, and um, you know, and I think, you know, despite all of us being over Zoomed, I think, you know, our reach has drastically grown. We have people all over the country. I think that's a possibility we can't deny as a, as a, um, a great, a great um, asset. It's a great uh, uh, possibility that we have that we never really thought about. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a opportunity for us to expand beyond New Jersey. Uh, I know we have people uh, Zooming from uh, all across the country. And I think, you know, um, what we have here are some amazing teachers. Like I said, the staff here is a knockout, you know, just awesome. And the faculty are great, you know, like, so why not, you know, why not share those, th those experiences and those opportunities across the country? I think that's awesome. I mean, so many of us that have been involved in the arts since for a long time have, have really tried to get us out of the building. I think that's really an important strategy to, to really pursue. We've had a lot of great comments about how enthusiastic people are about the energy you have. Maria, you can join us again. I've got a couple of quick questions that I think we can answer pretty quickly. Um, one is, um, uh, how big is the biggest one piece you've ever created so far? And, and do you uh, create any figurative ceramics? So the largest piece I made on the potter's wheel is a little taller than me. I think it's a, um, <clears throat> it was about six and a half feet tall. Um, and uh, I made that in, in uh, undergraduate school. And it, um, no, I made that in graduate school. Sorry, I made that in graduate school. It was taller than me. When it was fired, it was smaller than me. I still have it. It's outside. Um, I have a handful of these really tall pieces. Uh, and it was figurative. It had uh, figures on it. It was um, uh, a picture of a person painting a pot of a person painting a pot on a pot <laughs> of a person and whatever, you know? And so um, so that was, uh, I should be careful and say that was thrown in sections. So I, it was, it's about, 24 inches wide, about six and a half feet tall, and it was thrown in seven parts and then stacked and put together. So a little like a totem pole. It's a little yeah. like or, or an, a, a sort of a, a ceramic totem pole, I'll call exactly. that. And very, um, very someone hard. says they're trying to carve their own totem pole. Do you have any tips for an uh, amateur uh, carver? Let's keep that to just a few seconds. We're going to have Maria, you can join us again, and we're going to wrap up. Sharp, sharp, sharp tools. That's my, uh, my <laughs> recommendation. Always sharp. Oh, we lost Maria. We lost Maria. Sharp, sharp tools. tools. That's a that's great. Um, and then I think we've got one more question. I want to pop in here. I'm trying to browse through. How much uh, how much did Nathan Jackson influence your art? Uh, Nathan Jackson's life and his uh, the way he lives his life has affected me greatly. Um, his art is soulful, powerful, perfect abstraction. Um, you know that has impacted me. Um, you know, like, like I said, I made some work that was referential, um, uh, but haven't made uh, much sense, uh, since that time, but you know, like, it, you know, those are experiences, you know, like uh, that you have in your life that affect one way or the other, what you do from then on, uh, without question, these experiences I've had have a direct effect in what I make and why I make it. It might not manifest visibly, but you know, it's incalculable, all of these, all these people and all these experiences and, and what it, what it leaves behind. That's awesome. Uh, before we, before we have Maria give us a few final comments, I would just remind everybody that the Arts Council of Princeton is, you know, has incredible programs. We want to grow the programs. Um, I think you've seen that Adam is a great 
energetic professional artist who's going to help us with Maria and the whole team there do great, great work in the future, but we need some help. Um, you know, as you're thinking about uh, the end of the year, you know, I know this has been a tough year for a lot of people, but you know, as you think about the organizations you're going to support, we had over 100 people here tonight. Um, if each person could just go to the Arts Council of Princeton.org and donate, you know, it's a dollar, it's five dollars, it's fifty dollars, it's five million dollars. Uh, you know, no, no two, no, no two zero, no, no zeros too many or too few. Um, but we really appreciate it if everybody, you know, here just gave a little bit. Uh, we would be able to do more for students and for the people in our community. And we've got lots of people that are underserved in art. Um, you know, all the programs we've talked about, but also the outreach into the, the, the hospitals and the, you know, uh, different you know, elder communities that we do work. So I really would urge you to sort of, you know, deep, you know, in your pocket, go out onto the website if you've enjoyed this evening and, and give to the Arts Council uh, of Princeton. And of course, as you're thinking about the year end giving that you might be planning, uh, you know, remember the Arts Council of Princeton because there's a lot of work that is, a, is underway and a lot more that could be done. And as you've seen here, I think we've got an incredible leader. And I, I go back to my first comment. I, I think that we've got two incredible, powerful leaders. Uh, and so, Maria, uh, we're so thankful that you're the artistic director as well. And speaking on behalf of former board members and current board members and anybody else that I could care to, you know, to co-opt my opinion that I'm going to apply to them as well. We're, we could not be happier to have the two of you as partners in, in what's going to be a, a building of the Arts Council to be even bigger and better. And the final thing I would say before I turn it over to Maria is, and remember that the Arts Council of Princeton gets not $1 uh, of, of money from the municipality of Princeton. So um, other than you know, paid work that we do occasionally for them. So uh, the decorations of, of downtown for the Witherspoon um, area in terms of um, building for the, for the outdoor food, et cetera, that was a contract. But, but in general, there's no charitable support for the Arts Council. So unlike the library and other organizations, not a dollar from the municipality. So remember that when you're giving as well. Okay, Maria, off to you to wrap us up here. Okay, well, thank you so much, um, Adam. I, I feel like I learned a lot about you. And um, I have to say that uh, the staff has been enjoying getting to know Adam a little bit better. He, um, he laughs a lot from his office, so we find that encouraging. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that everyone on this call tonight um, can see an exciting future for us. And um, it, it, it's, um, his energy is very contagious and, and we're really excited about that. Um, I did want to mention a few things that are coming up for the Arts Council. We are doing Sauce for the Goose this year. Um, we're doing it outdoors at the Princeton Shopping Center. And um, if you think of a farmer's market and how farmer's markets worked this summer, that's how we're setting it up. So we ha already have uh, over 27 artists that are going to be joining us in the courtyard and that's November 14th from 10 to 4 and all of us at the Arts Council will be out there um, demonstrating ceramics and other art making weaving painting it should be a really fun day and we've got music planned so please come out and join us um, this weekend we have our last in the series of uh, our art and about program which has been um, I feel like it's been a big success every Saturday. We were going out and making art in downtown Princeton in different, uh, in different ways. And this weekend we'll be featuring augmented reality uh, mm -hmm. on an app on your phone, which you can participate in. And we're also making sugar skulls out on the terrace this Saturday with uh, my good friend, Veronica. And uh, we'll be using those for our Day of the Dead exhibition, which is coming up uh, November 2nd to the 14th. So please join us for that. And, um, and Maria, I've got to, I've got to, I got to pop in and say, I think we've been living <laughs> augmented reality for like seven months or nine months or something. So I'm not sure I can take any more, Maria. But uh, my final thing would be when you're out and about, make sure you're wearing your mask. So yeah. I'm excited yeah. to see everybody at uh, Sauce, but uh, make sure we're all wearing our masks. So um, thank you again, Maria. And you want to wrap it up, and we'll let people uh, get off to dinner. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And we will be back next month with another guest uh, to be announced soon. And uh, Tim, thank you. Adam, thank you. I'll see you in the morning. Thanks, thank, you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming and, and listening. And, and thank you all for your support. And thank you so much, Tim. Take care. Good night. Night. <laughs>